Have you ever known someone with AIDS who went blind? I have. Many people living with HIV due to opportunistic infections have suffered partial vision loss. If you had HIV and found out you were losing your sight, where would you go for help? What would you do? Find out today on AIDS Vision. Welcome to AIDS Vision. I'm your volunteer host, Allison <coughs> Arngrim, excuse me. And today on AIDS Vision, we're going to be talking about HIV and vision loss. With me today is Dr. David Boyer, who is the Associate Clinical Professor of Ophthalmology at USC, and Dr. Tina McDonald, who is an optometrist with the Center for the Partially Sighted. Welcome to AIDS Vision. Thank you. The aptly named show today, actually, it's a little ironic. Um, one of the things that I think a lot of people aren't really familiar with are what causes vision loss in AIDS? Uh, a lot of us who have friends with AIDS have seen people lose some or all of their sight. Uh, why is this? Well, the most common cause of visual loss in, in an HIV positive patient would be from cytomegalovirus retinitis. Um, CMV retinitis affects approximately 20 to 25 percent of patients with AIDS. There are other causes, uh, certainly other opportunistic infections, such as toxoplasmosis, herpes, can also affect the eyes adversely and cause visual loss. And there's also loss from central nervous system problems, such as cryptococcal meningitis, toxoplasmosis, and other infectious processes that affect the brain. So you don't actually need a direct infection of the eye to suffer vision loss? No, anything that will affect the visual pathway, much as an older person may suffer a stroke, the AIDS patient may have an infection that may actually cause a similar finding, a stroke-like loss of vision, actually s symptoms elsewhere in the body. Now, does this always cause complete blindness, or can it just be partial and stop, or what happens? Well, fortunately, um, we have drugs that are available today that have um, basically are able to treat cytomegalovirus, um, also drugs that are able to treat toxoplasmosis, and drugs that are able to treat herpes. Prior to having these drugs, there was a devastating loss of vision. But after these drugs have become available, we are able to slow down, and, and many patients do very, very well for long periods of time on these medications. Now, what about, I often meet people with AIDS who, they don't know the cause of the vision loss. They say, well, I don't have CMV, I don't have cytomegalovirus, I don't have toxoplasmosis. None of those particular infections have been diagnosed, but they still have vision problems. Do we know why this is? Well, you can have vision problems for a number of reasons. Um, many patients, just in a weakened condition, will lose some of their accommodation or their ability to read and, and see up close, and they get very frightened, come in worried that they have an infectious process, and really what's happening is that because of their weakened condition, they just don't have the muscles to be able to move the lens or accommodate and be able to read. Um, there are a number of conditions that are extremely rare that are very difficult to diagnose. You can have lymphoma that affects the retina. That can be very, very difficult to diagnose. Some of these even require a biopsy, uh, retinal biopsy or retinal choroidal biopsy to make the diagnosis adequately. 
So you could have any one of a number of conditions, and just because you didn't have an infection or know why it was, you could still be losing your sight. There are, there are a number of <coughs> infections that are extremely rare but obviously can affect the retina um, that can cause visual loss. The most common, the one that we're dealing with most commonly, however, is cytomegalovirus or CMV retinitis, which I would say would be 98% of the time. Now, how would someone first notice that they're really losing their sight? When should they be concerned? What symptoms would they have that it's really it's time to call the eye doctor? Well, there are several things. Number one, um, with both eyes open, it's very hard to, to even find visual loss. It's only sometimes when you close one eye that you realize you can't see as well in the other eye. So I think that any time anybody's checking any type of vision problem, you really need to check one eye at a time, and you do that by just simply, you know, covering one eye, checking, making sure your peripheral vision or your visual field's normal, and then closing and checking the other eye, making sure. The other thing that brings many patients in is an increase in floaters. These infections of the retina cause white blood cells to be liberated into inside the eye, and these manifest as little black spots. Now, I don't want people to run around thinking that every little black spot's an infection because it's certainly not. Uh, black spots are pretty normal in, in most people. But a sudden increase in black spots, or what we call floaters, would signify that the examination of the back of the eye or the retina should take place. Now, a lot of people with uh, HIV may be being examined by a regular doctor. Are doctors normally doing eye exams and checking them for these kind of symptoms? Well, I think that the doctors who take care of the AIDS patients in general, the infectious disease specialists, the specialists in AIDS, obviously check every part of the body. I think, however, though, in order to really pick up the earliest changes from any infectious process, it requires the eye to be dilated. It requires the eye to undergo a complete ocular evaluation. And the best person to do that would be an eye care specialist, an ophthalmologist or optometrist who's going to be able to dilate to look way out. To see that. Now, the examinations that, that you do as an optometrist at the Vision, vision Center the, mm -hmm. for the Partially Sighted, it's what you're looking for is what can be done to correct the vision? Right. Or what? It's a very functional exam. I'm looking at how the person is using the vision they have left and if I can enhance that to do the things that they need to do. We have some film that we, we took at the center when we did a visit, and if, if I show this, this is what someone goes through at the Center for the Partially Sighted. If, if you could explain to me what they're sure. doing here, can we show this? Right, this, this we know is the front door. <laughs> that much I've got down. Okay, as a patient enters, they're usually greeted by a volunteer greeter, and okay. immediately this person tries to make the patient comfortable. So they're not alone in their vision problem. The volunteers all have vision problems themselves. Okay. This is Dr. McAllister, and he'll speak with the patient, ask about goals, what the patient wants to achieve by being there. Now what is that? What is that piece of machinery? What is he doing? That's a slit lamp and what he's doing is checking the basic health of the front part of the eye, just figuring out what he's got to deal with to improve the vision. Okay, my first reaction is does this hurt? Not at all, <laughs> not at all. And the patient doesn't have to do anything at all, just look where the doctor directs. So he's not actually touching anyone's eye, he's just looking at the eye. Not at this point, no. Okay. And like I said, he's basically looking at the health. Is there any opacity that magnification isn't going to be able to improve the vision with? So that's if there's something visibly wrong with the lens of the eye, you'd be able to notice that right Correct. away. Or the you. cornea, the front part of the eye. And are some of those conditions then treatable if you spotted um, that it's? Yes, if we notice something that hasn't been previously noted, we will refer a patient out to an ophthalmologist to deal with that because um, all of our patients are followed regularly. We don't follow them um, in a medical sort okay. of. I, I noticed that when I was there, it, it seemed very user friendly, and, mm -hmm. and the exam seemed to be. One of the things I noticed was uh, there was a variety of eye charts. There, there weren't mm -hmm. just the letter charts. There mm -hmm. were charts with numbers and charts with different symbols. Uh, why is that? We have a lot of patients that don't speak English. We have a lot of patients that don't read, so they're not going to be able to say. F Z B D E, which seems obviously. rather obvious, but not knowing yeah. that, I saw a chart with numbers, and I was like, "Well, that seems convenient," but hadn't really thought of that. So, what are the the, the patients that you see? What are the the usual demographics? I mean, you don't just have people with HIV there, right? Generally, 
65 percent of the people I see are over the age of 65 and they will have something called age-related macular degeneration that affects the central portion of the vision or your best vision but their visual field their side vision is very good but that's changing now so with the Center for the Partially Sighted, what you're saying is, is that most of the people, as opposed to being blind or going blind, it's a partial vision loss. It's a, a tunnel vision or loss of or some blockage. Correct. Correct. In order to use magnification, we need some sort of residual vision to help it out with. And then you have various tools that you can use. Uh, do we have more video of, uh, of some of these tools that are being used here? Now what is this? Okay, This is a foropter and basically it's just a series of hundreds of different lenses and it allows us to give the best possible prescription which is important before we introduce magnification because you want light focused on the retina. And magnification is what? Anything from glasses to special equipment? Or? Right, it could be microscopes, telescopes. Microscopes and lenses. telescopes? Yeah. I mean, is this the kind of microscopes and telescopes that we'd normally think of, or is this um, something a little more? <laughs> they're designed a little bit differently. They're a little bit smaller than the ones that you'd look at the stars with. <laughs> something you can actually wear. Correct. They're usually in a glasses form. Doesn't look like regular glasses, but it's more normal looking. What's he doing now? He's checking the health of the inside of the back of the eye and basically looking what All right, he gets yeah, here's the charts. Here's a chart with letters, and there's one with numbers as well. Okay, he's just testing the best corrected vision, what is the baseline, what, is he, what does he have to start with. Actually this patient is doing very well, if you can read towards the bottom of that chart. Now what is this? This is a closed circuit TV or a CCTV, it's an electronic magnifier and we get the highest degree of magnification with this and she's just showing this patient what it does and how it compensates for the curve in that medicine bottle. And he's reading his prescription. Correct. So that would be a problem also people who have HIV or other medical conditions would have difficulty reading their prescriptions Definitely. with one of these. Would you have one of these in your house? Sure, yeah. A and lot of our patients do. Would do they borrow them or rent them or? Um, we don't sell them directly. We have representatives that will come out into the home and demonstrate. Well, he's reading the TV guide now. Right. They're multi-use. I had a lady that wanted it just to read her poly bags of veg frozen vegetables so she <laughs> so you can put everything from your everything groceries to your magazines to right. your books in this and it will make them enormous here right now I notice it's white on black is that easier for certain yeah, patients to see that's a lot more comforting to look at than white glaring back at you as my friend tells me when I go to the beach with her every summer what's that that's a talking alarm clock um, some people just don't want to bother with using their microscope to um, see the time, so you press it and it gives you the time. Oh, so when you also when you first wake up, if you don't want to reach for your stuff, you just crank up the, the clock. Choice other people can use it if they don't want to put their contacts in right away. What is this? This is a calculator. That's a talking calculator. You have talking and this and is this is just large print cookbook. That's the easiest form of magnification, just to blow up the print. Big print stuff. Okay. Well, I like that. I mean, I think I like the talking clock myself. Yeah, you want to put contacts in. So you, you have a whole set of different machines. I mean, everything from it can talk, it can just have bigger numbers, it can, and you, how do you determine which thing someone needs? It's according to their goals. Obviously, you can take that closed circuit TV and drag it around to the grocery store. So most of our patients have multi-use, multi-items for different uses. They'll have a little hand magnifier for going to the store, microscope for reading, so they have their hands free and can hold the book. And so what the equipment you would get would vary depending on your goals. And what type of vision loss you had, too? And what type of vision loss. So now if someone had something like the blockage, would the magnifying computer screen still work? Oh, definitely, yeah. It's just enlarging the image. So you'd have more of a field and then you could um, just sort of move around <laughs> until you saw it or what? Well, it's kind of like the principle of that little speck on the ground, you hardly see it until uh -huh. you bring it closer and that enlarges the whole thing. Um, patients with any sort of vision problems, we're not getting rid of the problem. We're just enhancing the image so they see it more easily. Okay. We're going to go to a break now and show a little PSA and we'll be right back with two more people from the Center for the Partially Sighted. Angelica has AIDS. Kevin has AIDS. Old Mr. Lee has AIDS. Tanya has AIDS. The family next door has AIDS. Ferdinand has AIDS. Chris has AIDS. Los Angeles has AIDS. Maybe you don't know anyone yet. All of us will. 
How could you help if someone told you that she had AIDS? That he had AIDS? I put them in touch with a source for all the services they need. AIDS Project Los Angeles. Give them this number. Help is very near. Welcome back to AIDS Vision. Today we're talking about HIV and vision loss, and I'm interviewing some people from the Center for the Partially Sighted. Uh, earlier I had some doctors explaining how vision loss can occur, and now I have Joey Terrell, who is the HIV and Vision Loss Program Coordinator for the Center, and Charles G., who is a client with the Center for the Partially Sighted. Welcome to AIDS Vision. Uh, earlier, Dr. McDonald and Dr. Boyer were talking about what causes vision loss in HIV and what exams are done to determine the degree of it. Now, Joey, your job then is to show people how, how to work with this vision loss, to give them tools, or? Well, I'm, I'm the coordinator of the HIV and vision loss program, so initially my job is that when a client calls in or somebody calling in for a client, um, explaining what their options are, what types of services are available to them, uh, answering any questions they may have concerning uh, the nature of their vision loss. Um, many times people call up before they actually start having severe problems and a lot of times there's a lot of education that goes on. And then depending on that phone intake and at what point they're at with their vision loss and to what degree uh, of sight loss they have will determine what services I then arrange to have provided to them. And some of them include uh, giving them various tools to, to use? Well, having them come in to be evaluated um, so that we can find the visual aids, filters, telescopic lenses, glasses, etc., that will work for them depending on what their goals are, but also um, to set up and schedule home visits for what's referred to as independent living skills. And by the sound of that, you can tell that it refers to any aspect of everyday living that a uh, person needs to do for themselves. So you actually come into people's homes and uh, say, show us your setup and we'll show you how right. to live here even though you can't see as well as you used to. Right, and the independent living skills that we provide uh, has been modified um, to specifically address the concerns of people with HIV and AIDS. Many times, for instance, the, the most immediate goals are being able to keep their regimen, being able to tell their medications uh, apart, be uh, being able to tell time so they know that this is the one they, they take at 1 o'clock, these are the pills they take at 2 o'clock, etc. Uh, being able to access public buildings, keep doctor's appointments, getting mobility instruction. There are some very you know, specific types of concerns that people with AIDS uh, have, when which I is a little bit the, different than the, the general population. The center, we saw some of the tools, was the, um, the uh, AIDS vision, was it the training uh, the training room. The at training the room where right. we actually teach them to do this. We have some footage of that if you could explain to me what we're sure. going to see here. Okay, so here well, you are. What are you doing? Here, here I am with a potential client, and we're going over a system of labeling and marking his medications in a, a tactile way. This is a person who is functionally blind, and so what we're doing here is we're marking these with a, a product that's called high dots, and they're little like sponge rubber dots and depending on where they're placed um, on the various medications and depending on how many, uh, we work out a system so the person, just by feeling them, by feeling that tactile designation, they can tell that this is their medication they take in the morning, but this is their AZT, this is... No, it's not actually Braille, though. No, it's not Braille. Braille, you know, people have a, a lot of misconceptions about Braille. Braille is an, an actual language that people right. have to learn, and many times it's not very appropriate, particularly if you've got someone in frail health uh, where their sense of touch might be altered. They're also dealing with all kinds of side effects of medications. So um, a more immediate way of uh, identification is to work out a system that works for them. Well, those are real big, too. I mean, you'd right. know those, those are real big. Those, and, you, know, you can't miss them. And the thing about those things is that, you know, even if the person is um, in bed and they reach over for their medications and the, the lights are off, they can still feel and know just by the tactile marking uh, which medication it is that they're going to take. Um, one of the things that we do with the uh, instruction that we provide is that we don't say there's any one set way of doing anything. It's all based upon the individual's needs and what the individual feels comfortable with. So some people prefer a particular um, type of way of marking something. Other people will prefer a different procedure entirely. Oh, that would make sense. That way you would remember it better if it's a system right, exactly. you worked out yourself. I, sure. That was what, The impression I got visiting the center was that it was very user-friendly. It was very much built around the client. Right. We, we definitely pride ourselves on trying to make a person feel as comfortable as possible because many times people that, that come to our center 
were not born with vision problems. They were born fully sighted. And so there's a, a huge psychological adjustment to the, the loss of that sight. So along with the actual instruction, we also provide psychological counseling, support groups, uh, individual counseling uh, around the issue of sight loss. And particularly when you have a person who's dealing with the, the dual um, uh, uh, problem of having AIDS and trying to manage their health care on top of uh, losing their sight. Here we're just demonstrating or showing how this microwave oven has been marked with high marks um, and uh, high dots. And on the b very bottom there, you'll see that big white. Um, uh -huh. uh, you did all the tape. odd numbers, so that way, yes. Right, one, it's very two, easy three, four, for a person right. to uh, be able to know that the odd numbers are covered with. Um, the high dots and in between are the even numbers. Now and then down below it. there, that contrasting piece of tape mm -hmm. is very, very easy for most partially sighted people to see. And you can tell that when you push that, that's where the microwave door will open. So that's right. So even with residual vision, that big white tape would just leap out at you, that that's the, that's the place to hit. Right. And sometimes the changes in the home uh, environment that we offer or do can be very, very simple. Now what's with the food? Here we're just going over uh, different techniques for identification of um, food and groceries. Um, the, um, at the center, we hold independent living skills classes. Most of the independent living skills that we provide to the HIV client are done in the home. Here I'm demonstrating how a dynamo labeler with very large letters can uh, make the difference between letting a person know that that can of chili is, uh, is a can of chili <laughs> as opposed to a can of dog food. Okay? And they're magnetic too, you pulled it off. Right, so there's, there's different varieties of ways of identifying things. And here, you just make like one set of labels and slap them on your cans and take them off yeah, and, and start and what, over and with Yeah, and what's great about that is that you, you, once you take off that label, you then have your uh, shopping list available. Oh, great. Here are two cans of corn, one's cream, one's regular, and the cream corn has a rubber band around it, so the person knows immediately. Here's a good indication of how two cans that are very, very different <laughs> um, are exactly the same size, and when you label them in a, with a dynamo labeler this way, some people have enough sight to be able to see those letters against the dark background because they're very high contrast, but they're also raised up, so if a person needs to, they could feel the letters and know. Here's another close-up of the dynamo labeler that's magnetic, and you can see that uh, I think I'll be taking a, a portion of that off right now. What people will do is they'll, they'll take that, um, their labels and they'll just stick them on the, the side of the refrigerator somewhere else, and then when they do their grocery shopping, they know that they just come in and label things. Here again is a close-up of the uh, very simple technique of using a rubber band to discern one style of a vegetable um, in, a, in a tactile way that's very, very simple. People, a lot of people figure these things out for themselves, but when you're dealing with all kinds of other issues, uh, it's difficult to do on your own. So some of these then are like, it sounds like some of this was created over a period of time from input from people who had vision loss themselves. Right. We've, we've, we've held classes at the Center in Independent Living Skills uh, since 1978. Here's a money organizer that uh, is a very simple device and makes it very easy for a person to tell their change, um, especially if they're carrying a lot. Here's an Big example checks. of a large print check. Um, it's difficult to tell on the TV screen, but those lines on mm -hmm. that check are also raised. So even if a person really? needs to write a check where there's not a lot of good light, they can feel it. Oh, that's nice. Those little forms it, you put over stuff? Right, a check writing guide and a signature card, uh, which makes it very easy for a person to be able to know where to sign their name or fill in a date, etc. cetera. Um, and here's a letter writing guide, uh, which helps a person to be able to um, write across in a straight line if they need to write any letters or um, anything that needs to be I could probably written. use that and I can see, so. Yeah. Uh. There was an example, <laughs> there was an example of somebody who wrote a letter with that uh, letter writing guide. Oh, that's great. So yeah, so even if you had line paper, if you're having trouble seeing the lines right there, you'd, you'd be on it. Right, Mo most people who are visually impaired really need a lot of high contrast and that's the basic principle for what you're seeing there. Here we have an orientation and mobility instructor going with the client, uh, going over instruction and in how to access or use uh, an elevator. Um, a lot of the HIV clients uh, have concerns about their mobility because many of them have to keep uh, weekly uh, doctor's appointments, they have to access public buildings, and sometimes just to be able to get around and safely to the post office, the, the local market, etc., uh, the instruction can really help them in getting around safely so they don't take a fall. Now, elevators now tend to have bigger buttons and larger print, but I noticed it was finding it like numerically, sort of feeling your way around. Sure, there. and every elevator can be very, very different. So, what the orientation and mobility instructor does is they go out to the home, they arrange a home visit, and they go over with the individual the uh, intersections nearest their home, 
the uh, elevators or markets, um, um, sidewalks, everything that's near the person's home that's actually going to, uh, they're actually going to need to use. So you teach them how to use their stairs right. and how to get up their doctor's front walk. And right. And then most of those techniques can be applied regardless of where they, um, you know, where they find themselves in whatever situation. That must be difficult though for someone who is losing their sight and has AIDS and is already in a very threatened position to say, okay, now I'm going to let you into my house and tell you how I go through my whole day and you're going to help me do this. Um, and you know what? Actually, it's it's not so much. A lot of the clients that come through the center through the HIV and vision loss program have been dealing with AIDS and managing their health for so long that they come in and say, "Show us what to do." I want to get to do Charles. Now, you are a client of the center, and you've been using all of this stuff. I take it. Uh, well, well, well. Now. Right now, I'm in the early stages of vision loss. Um, I can see basically pretty well, except for small things like reading medicine. Uh, I don't need a cane to get around with, but I can't read uh, medicine. I can't go into a pharmacy and read over-the-counter uh, over prescriptions. Uh, certain medications I can't take, aspirin, I can't read. Uh, the label to tell what's in it. Uh, the center though has provided me with uh, magnifiers for my home. You know, no problem with medicine anymore. Uh, contact lenses that's more suitable to my sight right now, which will probably become worse. And has the cost? What has the the cost been? I I know you mentioned to me earlier that it it was surprisingly low. Uh, the cost for all the treatment I've had so far, new contact lenses, uh, an exam that I thought was completely thorough, magnifiers, and even um, glasses for wearing in the evening, has basically cost about the same as one lens would have cost at my regular uh, the ophthalmologists or optometrists. Well, that's not bad. So you have a sliding fee system. Right. We're a private nonprofit okay. organization. I'm going to have to close, fee. and I, I want to thank both of you for coming on the show thank and, you and for thank all us. of my guests. And we'll be running the number for the Center for the Partially Sighted on the screen. Please get in touch with them if you're experiencing any vision loss at all. If you know someone is experiencing vision loss due to HIV or any other cause, please get in touch with the Center for the Partially Sighted for an evaluation. You may be able to use this, and they're very friendly people. Thank you for watching AIDS Vision.